Before the early 20th century, interior design was the purview of architects and occasionally artisans. We've seen people like the Adam Brothers get involved. They were first architects and then get into designing interiors. We've seen people like Frank Lloyd Wright, who is an architect who also wanted to really create an interior space and therefore became an interior designer in a lot of different ways. But things are about to change, especially as we move through the middle of the 20th century. Now, as we get into this period, as we're moving post World War I, we see department stores creating vignettes in their stores. This is primarily to sell things, but what they're doing, not intentionally, but they're doing it anyway, is giving people a sense of what they consider and what society at large considers to be good design. This is where a lot of the middle class will get their ideas of design. At least that's up until about 1936. Now in 1936, we see the development of the American Institute of Interior Decorators. And what they do is they create a professional association that will incorporate ideas of training and standards into the field. The interior decorator ends up filling a void by being able to create rooms in appropriate styles to suit the building that they're in. Now, one of the things, one of the important things that they're going to teach, unlike Bauhaus, is they want their designers to be able to design in a period. In fact, this is how most design was done at the time as we move through the middle of the century. A client would ask for a specific period and the designer would take that, they would update it a little bit, and then they would apply it to the space. Because of course, you wouldn't want strictly medieval furniture necessarily because it's big, it's heavy, it's bulky, there isn't a lot there, you don't have a dirt floor so it doesn't look good. You get the idea. So, we've set up for the development of the interior designer. Let's start talking about some of them. Elisa Wolf is going to be one of the first, or arguably the first, interior decorator. Now, she was a figure in high society with contacts in many areas. Her first project was actually to redecorate her own home from Victorian clutter to a more modern, simple style. That being said, uh, she received a great deal of publicity and published the House in Good Taste in 1913. This is one of the first publications that we're seeing. We've seen them off and on in the past from furniture designers and architects. But this is one of the first that is speaking to the general public. As with earlier architectural publications, this one had a far-reaching influence. Interior design became a popular subject in periodicals, which is another big key change that we're seeing in this period. The middle of the century, we see the development of mass-produced magazines for the general public. And so her influence will be felt in magazines like House Beautiful, Home and Garden, Good Housekeeping, and others. Now, her personal taste did not run to historic imitation, but in order to work with clientele who lived in eclectic buildings, she learned how to merge historic styles with what she considered to be modern good taste. She, for example, would combine delicate wallpapers, simple forms, and antique French furniture and reproductions, resulting in simplified interiors that are light and airy. And you're looking at this and going, wow, that is simplified. But it is compared to what she would have seen on a regular basis. Most of these styles, most of these ideas would be very busy compared to what we see from Art Deco. And her clients aren't looking for Art Deco, they're looking for period. Oftentimes, what they're looking for is they have a house in a certain architectural form and they want to mimic that in the interior. They don't necessarily want to go to the expense of buying an original Louis XIII chair, for example, but they will rely on her to find an updated, less expensive version that will fit within the space. Now, this gives rise to Ruby Ross Wood, who's a socialite, a writer, and would work with DeWolf. And for a number of years, uh, she worked with 
a man by the name of Billy Baldwin, who is known for his theatrical interiors. And what she does is she basically brings a certain personality to interior design. She's the first to really look at it as an art in and of itself and feels that it's perfectly fine to start mixing different periods and styles as we move forward. Now, she made use of strong color, flowery wallpaper, and antique English furniture. She also became a member of the decorating staff for one of the large department stores at the time in New York, known as Wanamaker. Uh, later, she'll open her own design firm. Now, I should keep in mind, these designers are working for very wealthy clientele. We don't see designers working for the middle class yet. Next, we have Eleanor McMillan Brown. Now, she studied at the Parsons School of Design as well as in Paris. And in 1924, she opened McMillan Brown Incorporated, an interior designing and decorating firm in New York. And she tends to use French-style furnishings in eclectic-style rooms and gave attention to scale and architectural detail. What do I mean? Well, she's going to take the same ideas that we've seen from, uh, for example, uh, Wolf in the past, and she's going to take, for example, that French furniture that's going to be very chic amongst the upper classes at the time, and she's going to mix it with the appropriate architectural details and architectural forms, for example, this bookcase, so that neither of them stand out as out of place. It all fits in the room, but it gives it a sense of modernity, yet an understanding of the classical world or an understanding of the past. This gives the client the sense of being really well educated, very cosmopolitan, and will speak to them, even though it's an obvious mix of style. And that's where we're getting it from. So whereas we started with, we kind of stick with a style and we update it, here we're getting to the point where we are mixing styles known as eclectic design. Then we get to Dorothy Draper. Now, she establishes the first commercial industrial design firm in the United States. She's a modernist in that she avoided period rooms. She was one of the first to design the interiors of public spaces, including the Dorthenium, which was a restaurant in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. And department stores, corporate offices, theaters, and vehicles would be designed by Draper, who uses vibrant colors cabbage roses, chintzes, bold stripes, and counterchange patterns on floors. She's well known for using elaborate plaster moldings on surfaces, including ceilings, doors, and walls. And she will again write to the general public as well through various periodicals. So what she's doing is she's bringing in these bright, bold colors and the use of, again, bright, bold floors. She's breaking with what had been the pattern at the time, that idea of using a specific, a specific period as the basis for all of your design. Because, of course, as these people see it, technology and society have moved past that. So we should move to something new. And in all of these designers, we see that Bauhaus idea where while there is some background in what is in the past, art history or history of interior design, they're creating something brand new out of it, not trying to mimic, uh, specifically mimic the past. And amongst her spaces are pools and forms like this. So what we have is a mix here. So for example, we have these massive Doric columns uh, around the pool. It gives it a very classic feel, but then we have these very minimalist sort of table settings. And we see a floor that is very complex, almost mosaic, speaking to sort of modern Rome, if you could think of it that way. So. An interesting mix of forms, but really speaks to the world at the time. They're transitioning from the traditional world, a world focused on what happened in the past, to this world where they're focused on what could happen in the future. And so she's taking from both of those to speak to the society. And that's the important thing about interior design and interior decoration. If you want to be famous for it, it's not good enough 
to know the periods. It's necessary that you speak to the brighter to the wider society just like art has to speak to the society that creates it design has to do the same thing